Live from the San Jose Convention Center, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering Hadoop Summit 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Hortonworks, and by EMC, Pivotal, IBM, Pentaho, Teradata, SyncSort, and by Attunity. Now your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live back here in Silicon Valley in San Jose for Hadoop Summit 2015. This is where all the action is in the big data, in the big data world. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the scenes from the noise. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE Media. I'm joined with George Gilbert, Wikibon's new big data analyst. And of course, we have the analyst segment with Merv, Adrian, Legend, Gartner, uh, uh, consulting analyst with Gartner. Welcome to theCUBE again, CUBE alumni. It feels good to be back. Three years in a row here. Right. Merv, always great seeing you. You're on the cutting edge. You, you know, you work hard. I know you work hard. I see you talking to everyone. You're getting the data. You're sharing with your clients, and you're the talk of the town here. You have um, a survey that was referenced in the keynote. Yeah. So, what's going on? I mean, I was predicting coming in this show it'd be consolidation, uh, ghost town. I didn't say ghost town, but I was, you know, thinking ghost town. <laughs> Not yet. Um, Not but yet. yeah, it's packed, and then, but it just feels like the tide's pulling out for a wave of change coming in from the cloud side. So I see I see analytics kind of paused here. I see people doing it. It just seems like there's a lot of like friction around configurations, a lot of like how to wire things together. I got a systems management product from, you know, X, Y, from the 90s, how to write more software. Yet the cloud, you got containers, you got orchestration. So it seems to be like a beautiful like collision coming. Thoughts? A beautiful collision. Um, I guess I could quote Roseanne, Rosanna Dana here and say you ask a lot of questions, um, but that's exactly what the market is doing right now. In fact, we, we tracked for a while the flattening effect of these new technologies on the traditional DBMS vendors, and that's really started to show up in 2014. The market was definitely a little flatter. This is one of the ways you measure things you can't measure directly is by the impact they have on the things around them. Astrophysicists do that, yeah. right? They can't see that planet 20 light years away, but they can see it change the orbit of the things around it. Much of the open source stuff isn't monetized, and technology analysts and financial analysts track things by dollars. So it's not easy necessarily to measure the effects directly. But it seems to me that all those questions that you ask and all those variables that the early mainstream market starts to consider um, are the things that give pause and lengthen the sales cycle and make the whole market just slow down a little bit. At Gartner, we've got a model called the hype cycle. Yep. People have seen that model. People love the names of the different stages. The trough of disillusionment is the favorite, and that's the part of the cycle that Hadoop is heading into right now. Uh, we've been saying that for quite some time. Said it here, actually, last year and the year before. We yep. talked about where we're going. So yes, we published this survey. Um, in that survey, we talked about the fact that 54% of the people we surveyed in that particular research said they don't have any plans to buy Hadoop now, and they don't have any plans to invest in it in the next two years. Is that trough of disillusionment because we didn't get the bowling alley app that took us across the <laughs> chasm? Or We're going to mix our, our Jeffrey Moore's with our Gardner well, hype cycles here? Well, those, the, <laughs> yes, your hype cycle and actually his yeah, Chasm well they used it last similar. year, so to, to say, they led that in the keynote, so like oh. they were bringing that up last year. Yeah, no, or it's totally years a reasonable question. Did we, did, we, did we not find that, or is the problem that on the other side of the chasm we encountered, you know, this complexity that we were talking about that is, for administrators is crushing, potentially, and you know, for developers as well. So the question is, is it, is it, Really slowing us down, is it a momentary pause? Is it just a matter of time? Um, and it's a little bit of everything. So George, if you think about um, what people, well, two years ago when I was on here, we talked about what is Hadoop as an existential question. And one of, the, uh, one of the features of the keynote I did that year was how many projects are the major distros supporting? And that number went up last year and it went up again this year. So one of the problems with the question of what am I going to do about Hadoop is which Hadoop do you mean? You what mean is the, uh, yeah. the, the brute force batch processing thing that I can do ETL with? Do you mean the thing that now is reasonably capable for interactive SQL? Do you mean the thing for streaming <laughs> event <laughs> processing and risk analysis I can do now? Um, um, yes, please, let me have one of those. 
so people are as they they're normally groping, do, they're groping for something, right? I well, mean, well, yeah. I mean, what, for a couple of years, Hadoop was a technology in search of a solution. That's not an issue anymore. Now the issue is that the people who are marketing Hadoop have so many potential solutions to talk about that they're confusing people in terms of which one is it that we want right now. And we still, in the survey work we do, get the number one issue people having is, where's the value? And it's not that the value isn't there. We've always believed there was value there. Yeah. But what's happening is that they're not sure which thing to do first. But this Go ahead, something Judge. in that, going back to Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm, sure. which is very, you know, it's, it's just a different, it's a different perspective on the same phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that always said, pick one application and put, you know, all your wood behind that one arrowhead. Sure. And, you know, some people thought it was data warehouse offload, you know, the ETL offload. Yep. Some are like customer 360. You know, is it that, that um, customers are hearing too many and are just confused? That depends on what your go-to-market strategy is. If your go-to-market strategy is to be the best at one thing, then that's your focus. If your go-to-market strategy is let's make our TAM, our total addressable market, as big as possible by offering a lot of different things to a lot of different people, um, then you're going to let a thousand flowers bloom. But and is that, anyone going to market with uh, with just one? You know, solution? not anymore. No. Well, he's just saying they go through different things, and I think one of the things we observed in the cube was is that there's so many flavors of touch points at the edge of the network and the business units that it's hard to ask one person, one body of truth of what is it, right? So you can, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Sure. So if I'm the business unit manager and I'm doing omni-channel analytics, I care about one thing. Now, how to replicate the broader market opportunity? You then got to talk to exact matches so of that, say, one use case. Let me do it by analogy for a second. Consider Teradata. Um, you could say Teradata just sells one thing. They sell data warehousing. Um, they wouldn't agree with you, by the way. They do a lot of other things. But even when, arguably, a few years back, that was pretty much all they did, they still didn't go to market that way. They went to market around a whole series of very specific solutions that were enabled and empowered by an effective data warehousing strategy because the guys with the wallets and the checkbooks are the guys who have a business problem to solve, not the people who are interested in a particular technology. Yeah. As we move from, use Jeffrey Moore's if you want, if we move across the chasm to the mainstream market, the buyers are different. They're not interested in technology for technology's sake. They're not picking up the latest bright, shiny object. They are thinking about business problems they can solve. And so today, we identified in this survey this sizable number of people who are stopping and thinking. And so I say, can I get a close up here? The close for a up. Second? Um, Extreme close up. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a professional analyst. This glass is half empty. Now, you can disagree with me if you now, want. Now, I'll hold it. I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> this glass is full. There you go. <laughs> you know, so, you know. So it's it's just a question of your, yeah, perspective. your perspective. Yes. Now, there's a great blog post that Sean Connolly of Horton Works wrote in response to our survey data where he positioned the data that we had in terms, in fact, of the Jeffrey Moore model and said, if you look about the stages of adoption and you look at the data that Gartner showed, um, we're, we're right on track. And you know what? I don't disagree with him. In fact, I tweeted uh, after he published that blog post, hey, take a look at the blog post we published about the same issue and you decide whether we actually disagree or not. We don't disagree. If you follow poll results for the upcoming election, which is only 37 years away right now, but we're already talking about it, Poll results will change every week. Polls about technology that are based on buying intentions are going to change. <laughs> Maybe not every week, but they're going to change pretty frequently. And if you think about the future in terms of buying intentions as expressed by technology people inside companies, that's like deciding what the world economy is going to be like based on kids' letters to Santa Claus. Okay, yeah. it, It's not a reliable predictor. It's useful for the moment. And it says that our understanding of the maturity of the market accords pretty well with what buyers today are experiencing. It doesn't say, and Gartner is not saying, okay, so let's talk about the this survey. is going to stop. So John Chambers gave his last keynote yesterday at Cisco Live, and he said 40% of the companies will be dead in 10 years if they don't embrace 
Cisco technology, and which includes big data. Let's throw that aside. Cisco. I'm going to make this glass empty. Hold on. <laughs> so, don't throw the water at me. I had it happen to John Cleese. Uh, so I've got to get your talk um, uh, perspective on this. So there's no doubt a future roadmap that people can acknowledge. Hey, I see data, it's new innovation. I got to get there somehow. Certainly I think that's clear, right? That was the, the first ramp up. But as we come into the cash, yep. so I think cash is a good proxy because that's a value value exchange. I'm going to give cash, you're going to deliver me value. Yeah. Not just throw away POCs, but yeah. like real sustainable mainstream You said the key word, you said value, you didn't say technology. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. So, so, so the survey you talked to, go deeper on that. Targets, what was the profile, was it mainstream? What sure. were some of the kind of questions you were teasing out? People who really want to get into the detail can either read the research or look at last year's interview. We described the research circle very well, but briefly, it's enterprises. Your interview here. Your yeah. interview here. With you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on the cube, you know where you go for all your good information. Um, we talked about it last year. It's a it's a global enterprise survey. Thousands of enterprises participate in it. It's vertically distributed, it's geographically distributed, it's, it's size distributed. It's comprehensive. So it's adequate for reasonable proxy analysis of, of the market. We got nearly 300 people to respond to a specifically Hadoop-oriented survey. Um, they ranged across geographies and verticals and sizes um, in, a, in a representative way, the way the whole the whole. All right, so let me ask you a personal question. Work. So you're a veteran, you've been in the industry for a long time, you've seen things come and go, you know the bullshit when you see it. When you smell the results coming out, out of the survey, what is it, What's, what is Merv, what was your first reaction? What was it like, oh fuck, or was it like, oh <laughs> Did you damn. just say that? <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not censored, so we can say oh that. Oh my God. No, no, but like, was, it, was it like, aha, like we're screwed? Was it like, man, we're going to have an inflection point? What was your personal gut reaction to the data? Wow, this is really mapping the way I thought it would. <laughs> Seriously, um, you know, we have this hype cycle model. We update it every year. Uh, in the blog post I referred to that I put up a couple of days ago with, with my colleague Nick Hudecker, we showed the 2014 hype cycle and we showed the dot on the hype cycle kind of entering the trough. 2015 hasn't been published yet, but you can be sure that the dot's going to move along a little farther. And, you know, the inflection point is when you get to the bottom of the trough, we start yeah. heading up again. And what's going to start? Implicitly, we've been predicting exactly yeah, that yeah. would happen. Yeah. What's going to move us? Um, what do vendors have to deliver in terms of value to start moving us back up the curve? You actually answered the question in the way you asked it. They have to deliver value. But, but and I'm they have to start you, talking about delivering value, you know, not like, technology. Are there specific. You know, like, cust is it back to customer 360 or, um, you know, what we call systems of intelligence, you know, marrying the transactional data and... Oh, I think what you're asking is, I think what he's asking is, are the vendors community, are they inadequate in their product set, Merv, or is it just rubber meets the road, change the linguistics of how they talk to customers, yeah. talk sure. to the customers in their language, is there more white space to fill in, more M&A from the big guys, what do so you... So there, there's two pieces here. I, I wouldn't call it inadequacy as much as I would call it immaturity of product, and I will say that in this morning's keynote, we heard three core themes that we were supposed to hear at this conference, one of which was enterprise readiness, and then we sat in that room for two and a half hours and we didn't hear about enterprise readiness except one slide that Arun put up about Ambari and Ranger and a few few words said about Falcon. I know we're going to hear more. This morning's keynote was all about the value questions and George, to your point, I think we're going to see a set of value-bearing application categories, use cases, if you will, um, that are going to be the use case 2.0, God help me, of, of the Hadoop story. Customer 360, risk analysis, you know, that was wave one. The yeah. early adopters all went there. Think about who the early adopters were. They were the big websites, they were the big financial institutions, they had a set of very well understood problems. Now how do we get to the rest of the market? What's the mainstream going to care about? Do they have the same set of concerns? And by the way, will their sales cycle look the same? Absolutely not. You're going to have to spend a lot more time making and proving a case, sometimes by reference to other companies like you who have yeah. done the same thing. The buyers are different in this stage of the market than the buyers in the stage of the market we've largely yeah. completed. The different second piece skill is sets and the skill sets are yeah. still a gap, and there's two ways to fix it. You build the skills, and we're doing that, and you make the product easier to use. You improve the yeah. fit and finish. You put the interface on it. 
this morning, Hortonworks demoed what they're going to do to provision in the cloud, that technology that they acquired. Very cool. This is going to make it frictionless. That's the, there's a lot of friction right now. It's really hard to adopt this technology. So what's the second point? This there's another point coming. Well, the first point was the change in the, um, uh, what was the first point? It was the change in the, the. What in, in um, well, the, Go ahead, wave what two, I you said we, we were going to experience cases. a new sales cycle. We were going to see um, new, new applications. Yes, so and, that's the value piece. And the piece. third was the fit and, and the finish, third thing is, the second thing is the enterprise readiness of the product. Oh. That is, how confident I am yeah. in its security, yeah. in its availability, I mean, these are the new pieces now. I would say that's overlapping between product and also vibe to the culture, I mean, the mindset. Customers got FUD, they're going to be going to pull back. The early adopters <laughs> didn't care about those yeah. things. They the rolled mainstream the dice. does. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Well, the these early adopters were the guys who partially helped build it. Yeah, and, and you know, they were sitting in a silo. They had a cluster. That cluster might not even be connected to the rest of the company. So is analytics, they a, pro had a, is analytics a process or product? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go about talk about OpenStack for a second. Lydia at Gardner, Lydia Long, yes. um, was um, at an event last year, or two years we were at, um, an OpenStack event in, in Silicon Valley, and it was awesome, packed house Merv. This is yeah. a classic uh, tie into your point. Packed house, how many people are running OpenStack in production? Not one hand went up. Okay. That's, okay. by the way, how many people know they're running OpenStack yeah. in production? <laughs> Might have been a better question. But, so, but now OpenStack has had its, yeah. you know, it's in a trough, it's been consolidating, seeing what's going on there. I was expecting this show and this ecosystem to be similar, not from a growth standpoint, there's no doubt there's growth, Yeah. clear, but at least some sort of positioning around, consolidating around those swim lanes, those uh, use cases, those reference architectures, because it's a packed house, I mean, it's a packed house here, it's not a ghost town here. So this is the blessing and the curse of the open source ecosystem. This is a model of let a thousand flowers bloom, there are hundreds of projects at Apache. There are 16 or 17 projects in each major Hadoop distribution. And there's a half a dozen more that everybody's buzzing about that aren't in any of them yet. Some of them are supported only partially, like for example, everybody loves Spark this week, okay? But nobody will offer you support for Spark SQL yet, because that piece is not as ready as the other pieces are. So there is this constant, incredibly fertile innovation going on across the stack, outside the stack, extending the stack. Then there's the challenge of integrating it all together. Then there's the challenge in figuring out who's going to use these things we're building. Yeah. We're not done yet. We need, you know what we need? We need OSA, the Open Spark Alliance, to create <laughs> some stable. But do you, do you, let's talk about Spark. I want to get your take on Spark. You mentioned that, which we'll be there next week. Nothing I was of, joking, by the way, there's no OSA. Yeah. Um, but Spark's got a lot of legs. There's value there, but you brought up the readiness issue. So are we in this circular dependency of get the innovation going and then get the readiness, SLA proof, future proofing that around SLAs? We, we talk to a lot of people who are using Spark. Um, and most of them are early stage startup companies. Think Hadoop Summit 2012. Yeah. Um, so we're at a very similar um, technology status point, but the guys at Databricks learned a great deal from watching the building of the Hadoop ecosystem. To give you an example, O'Reilly is already selling certification classes at their events for Spark, and, and the product is hardly shipping, right? So the partnerships they lined up when they announced the product readiness was like a who's who of Silicon Valley. Everybody was already lined up. That may be a blessing, it may be a curse, they, they if came they misfire, out, they're going to have huge problems. Yeah, they came out of the gate looking like they had already conquered the world. And, and where we are today is people are now beginning to say, so tell me, is this thing actually working? And it's working pretty well. You no, know, it's working technically few, well, but you got few you, challenges. We had a feature earlier, and we talked on this on the earlier segment. If you're a startup like Databricks, which I'm a big fan of, by the way, yeah. my friend Pete Sunsini's on the board, big fan, but I just don't see how they're going to make money with Amazon and the big guys co opting these, what looks like a feature. So the question, I mean, that's my personal opinion, but the question to you is if you're a startup, yes. when do you have to really kind of get off the mindset of I'm a feature to the platform or product? Because the features are being rolled up, certainly Amazon's 
and the cloud is rolling out a lot of features. Sure. So when do you, what's your advice? How, what do you share folks? Uh, sh the the way on? that you do that as a, as a commercial provider of software technology is you, you keep throwing it at the wall and you see what sticks. And once you see what sticks, you double down. Um, a lot of people describe Google's model that way. The difference with Google's model is they just keep throwing more stuff at the wall. They never pick something that sticks yeah. and really go after well, monetizing for, and for building it. For 10 out. years, no yeah. one could figure out what their strategy was, and then yeah. they did pick the stuff that stuck and put it together. Sort of, yeah. But, but at some point you say, this is my product, I'm building an organization around it, I'm creating a pricing model, I'm hiring a sales force, I'm building a support organization. That's what software companies go through. Some of them have been very successful. Um, Apache Cassandra was around for a long time, and Datastax is an overnight success, right? I mean, they really figured this out in the last couple of years and made it work. Mark Logic floated around for years and never really climbed out of their niche till a couple of years ago they repositioned the company, changed their pricing model, changed how their salespeople sold, changed how they filled their pipeline, and they're taking off. Was that Get tactical it? execution product related or business model related? Uh, I think it's about execution. I think you, you the product is, is necessary but not sufficient. Yeah, yeah. If you want to get to escape velocity, and emerge yeah. from yeah. the morass, you mm -hmm. have to be able to execute effectively. And we're surrounded by technologies that will not hit escape velocity here. Yeah, because the consumption of the buyer, the person who writes the, the check, ultimately def defines what it is. Okay, so given that consumption drives value and checks validate value, I got to ask about ODP, okay? There's a lot of big players who have customers that write checks, um, you were kind of split down the middle on your blog post on it a couple of months ago. Yep. Um, what's your take on it now? Do you see any change, any kind of sunlight? The argument is, hey, you know, my clients don't move as fast as the open source community. I want to provide some SLA, some big moving customers. And the other argument is it's just a land grab. We know this movie, we've seen it before. What's your take? Well, that blog post you referred to was a, um, was a dialogue between two crumpy, grumpy old Muppets. Um, me and, it turned out it was me and Nick Hudecker, not really Statler and Waldorf. And we were both writing both sides of the great, argument. It was a great post. The, the point was to, to, to talk about the pluses and minuses. It was debate society exercise. Many of the issues we raised there remain true today, that there is uncertainty in the marketplace about who this is for. It's clearly for the vendors. Yes. It's useful for them because it says they have a target to point to. If I'm Tableau, if I'm SaaS, if I'm IBM Cognos, I, and I know I have a stable platform, I know if I write to this, it's going to work in a certain way. SaaS wrote a great blog about that when ODP was launched, and it's a valid point. Does that matter to the customer, um, is the big question. And if I'm a customer today, let's not say today, because they actually haven't even finished drawing up the rules of, of, of incorporation for yeah. the thing, but let's say six months from now. Uh, I walk in the door and, and, and I'm trying to sell you something and it's ODP compliant, and you look at me and you say, that's great, but listen, I'm actually using Impala, I'm running Cloudera, and that's not ODP compliant. Do you not want my money? What's your answer going to be? Uh, I, uh, we're Impala compliant. We're happy. To, we're <laughs> happy to make that work for you. So, yeah. from the customer's point of view, what they care about is: is my tool, is my yeah. app going to run on this platform? But it just reduces the number of targets you have to certify for. Does no? it? I mean, how many no, different IBM, SQL IBM interfaces would say, are there IBM now? Would say, Get off is Impala. that going to become part of ODP? Is maybe Zookeeper going to become maybe part not, of but ODP? Some, some subset of the uh, projects. Now that's the question. No, IBM would say. You shouldn't go with Cloudera. They're not going to be around for a while. Use our version of Zookeeper. Well, wait, well, which IBM that. am I talking to? If I'm talking yeah, to true, global right? professional services, IBM will sell me Oracle if that's what I want. Yeah, it's true. So again, the commercial side of this argument is, yeah. does it meet a customer need? And that's going to slow the market down. I think that's a really good point. I mean. I, I'm not anti-ODP. Um, first of all, it's not here yet. Um, so we need to see what actually comes out. The definition of a core is perfectly reasonable. The question is how much, to your point, does this inhibit the advancement at any layer of the stack by saying, okay, stop, no more three of these, we're going to use this one from yeah. here on out. That is antithetical 
to the ethos of the Apache Software Foundation, it's playing which chicken is innovate, with, it's, innovate, It's playing innovate. chicken with the, with the foundation. But so we'll see. Are, what you're expressing also is a manifestation of that complexity of all the projects bubbling up and you know, ISVs, SIs, partners just know, not knowing what to target. It's a blessing and a curse, yes. absolutely. Okay. That's why it's easier for the vendors if we have that set of standards. Merv, we got to get the hook here. I've got Greg uh, getting us the hook. Um, great to see you on theCUBE. Always a pleasure. You're awesome, great analyst. Um, psyched to have your insight, and I'm sure you're sharing your research agenda for next year, so if you're watching, it's all there. It's asynchronous, so you got to kind of piece it together. <laughs> next year we'll be talking about Flink and Samza, and God knows what else. So, I'll yeah. give you the final word. Summarize what's going on here in Silicon Valley, here at Hadoop Summit. What is the action for the folks watching, trying to get read the tea leaves who's not in the trenches, bottom line, what's going on? Last year, we said, if you're not on board, you're late. The train is much farther down the track now, and you're even farther behind if you're not on board. I think the, I think the key right now is for people who want to get into this technology today to start expecting it to act grown up. We need product maturity, and we need to demand that the vendors offer us product maturity. We like to hear about all the great new bright shiny objects, but tell me that I can rely on it now. Tell me when I can rely on it. Tell me how well it's going to integrate with the rest of my fabric, and you're going to get my money. I'm a mainstream buyer. This is a mainstream technology now. Needs to start acting like one. Okay, we are here, great segment. Two world-class analysts, Merv Adrian, George Gilbert, here inside theCUBE, Merv from Gardner, George from Wikibon. We'll be right back after this short break.